Right, today's radio is a uh, Marconi. You can't quite see it there, can you? There's the uh, a G Marconi logo, and it's an interesting one. It's a 4170 model. Um, it's shown in the manual as being a Marconi phone, but it's not actually being sold as a Marconi phone. Here it's got the old G Marconi label on it, but it was also sold as an HMV which was another brand which was at the time owned by Thorne and came under the umbrella of what was known as the British Radio Corporation. It's, <coughs> you can't see much from this end. You turn it over and you can see all the uh, business end of it. Now I will say, this is an absolute health and safety nightmare, this handle. <laughs> there is very little clearance here as you get it just around this sharp corner and I have hurt my fingers quite a few times trying to carry this around and it's quite heavy um, it's really badly designed that I have to say um, we looked at a Marconi phone before and uh, the uh, red radio video if you remember um, and I quite like that one it's still one of my favorites I still use it quite a lot this one not um, well this is more of a 60s thing I mean this is late 60s and you can sort of tell from the the layout it's more late 60s than early 70s um, nice chunky buttons though um, here there's a socket for your headphones socket for tape recording um, some nice big controls here the usual functions telescopic aerial here also um, use of a sort of um, rose gold colored panel many years before Apple decided that was a trendy thing to have um, nice clear tuning scale as well quite like that on the other side of it, we have, um, there says a 9 volt supply socket here, which was fairly rare at the, in those days. Um, maybe there was a supply that came with the unit, maybe not, I don't know. Um, and a socket for a car aerial, and you can switch that in um, with this car. Thing here so that switches off the internal aerial and uses a car aerial again it's quite common in the 60s because a lot of people didn't have radios in their car so they just took their radio this massive thing and put it in their car plugged it in um, so it seems to take a PP9 battery which we can see by removing this thing here um, so let's get that in there and see what we get. Right, battery's in. Get some hiss. Oh, I'm short. Oh, mm -hmm. Well, that's uh, not encouraging. Whatever happens, we just get hiss. Doesn't even go up and down with the volume control. Um, none of these make any difference now this could be a good thing this could mean it's a very simple fault and that it's something around the audio so once we fix that all the RF stuff is fine I'm trying to show some optimism here give us a break let's have it apart and see what happens well this is undoubtedly a very large beast to take apart I suspect the first thing is um, get the battery out again um, <sighs> might be better if I turn that on its side I suppose there's a oh I think that was supposed to be cover up the innards of the thing from the battery compartment um yeah that's, that's what sort of come seems to have come unglued there put that back in later um some screws here in fact i should really look at the manual shouldn't i and that would tell me how to take it apart yeah here we go release battery cover take out battery three countersunk screws also telescopic aerial great let's do that then so here's the first problem uh, this screw here, which is essential to getting the thing apart, is absolutely gone. Uh, there's no way any screwdriver is going to remove that and 
it doesn't seem very loose so I think this is a uh, drill out job right well that put up a bit of a struggle but I have managed to drill out the bottom of the aerial screw now and as advertised the whole thing comes apart in one go which is quite handy we have a separate you know the whole box comes off um, and we have full access to the chassis so let's see what we've got yeah nice big speaker here um, quite solid looking wiring um, big tuning capacitor there uh, now next thing is where do we get at things to try and fix them so I suppose what we need to do is get the audio amplifier bit and uh, inject a signal there and see if we can get that to work the one thing I've noticed here is what weird resistors we have um, these are nothing like the convention these are all resistors so they're nothing like the conventional sort of cylindrical things I've never seen anything like this before um, must have been a thing around that time um, but I, I can't ever recall seeing resistors like that um, anyway my feeling is I think this capacitor here looking at the diagram um, this capacitor here C78 and if I look back at the um, schematic which is somewhere here so C78 is right at the input of the audio stage here after the volume control so if I just pull the end off that capacitor and inject a signal here or well, if I just pull the end off that capacitor does it start working or do we get anything and I suppose it better then follow backwards so going back to the um, back to the picture um, these are obviously the um, output power transistors uh, oh, there's still more foam there I thought I got all that that's really annoying um, so these are the power transistors we can just trace the circuit through I think and see what we get right so I think the answer is I should have looked further back because um, if I look back at the diagram I put everything back and I'm still getting the same result here a lot of nasty DC on that pot and the other thing I found is that if I then put a signal on um, so let's go back to the diagram for a moment um, so I put C78 back into circuit and then that goes back to the wiper of this volume control here so what I'm going to do is put a signal on the wiper of that volume control and see what happens so let's get a earth point a signal generator and I go to the middle of the volume control which you can't quite see here let's get you into view right so there's the middle of the volume control that blue wire there is a pot and uh, and I get a signal there so if I inject a signal onto that I get something but if I inject a signal onto the other end of that either way I get nothing so I suspect it actually the problem is that that pot is bust right now I've had to do quite a bit of more dismantling now and um, so what I've found is taking this finally taking this thing off uh, apart from that I've broken that capacitor which we can easily replace and it's got some resistors tacked onto it as well um, so measuring across the pot from one end to the other um, let's get the meter in shot um, measuring across the pot from one end to the other 25k which is pretty much what we expect measuring from the wiper to this end do I get anything no actually that's my fingers that are giving that resistance there I'd say that wiper of the pot is open circuit so yeah this is a weird volume pot look it's got a sort of tapped 
volume control in the middle. And so there's a tapping in the middle of it there, which is feeding into it, and then the wiper goes on the other side of it. So it's, it's got a strange sort of arrangement there. Um, so that's going to be very hard to source. Now this is going to be a real problem because I don't know how we make another one of these. The only thing I can think of is maybe I can get a thing apart and see if I can fix the problem. Um, it's going to be a struggle, I know that. Okay, so let's, so I've pulled the lugs away from it and here is the resistor assembly. And Yeah, there's a middle point, or not quite a middle point here. So let's look at the assembly. There's a middle, not quite a middle point here, and that's the tapping point. And then here's the wiper. Um, pull the whole thing apart. So this is the wiper. Maybe just it needs a bit of a clean on the wiper, I don't know. Um, The track seems to be intact. So let's just measure the track again just to make sure we're clear about that. So yeah, we've got 25k there. We've got a tapping point at 15k. We've got a wiper here that should connect. So uh, where does that go? That, this bit here. Are we getting any connection between that terminal and that central point? Yes, we do. That is connected. So really, if I had that in, I think I've got the right way around now. I've forgotten which way it goes. I should be able to get a variable resistance out of the middle here. Yeah, I can move this around and I can get some resistance. So it may just be, I'm just going to clean this up and put it back together, I think. And hopefully that will get us working again. Now, with the cleaning these carbon things, this is a carbon trap pot, as you can see. So it's basically got a, a graphite type um, carbon film here too, uh, which is what does the resistance. You've got to be quite careful cleaning them. You don't just rub it off. Um, so you can't put any solvents on it or anything. The best thing to use actually is um, the best thing to use is just a little bit of paper, actually, which will will sort of clean it. So yeah, you can see if I just get a little piece of paper here and completely drop it and lose it, um, you can get a little piece of paper here and I just rub that across the central bit. We'll polish it up, and you can see that's now coming up a bit better. Um, and you can see that it removes all the rubbish without too much um, trouble. I mean, I could put some isopropyl on it, which might be a bit bit of worthwhile doing, uh, maybe. But um, yeah, we'll do that. I'm hoping when I put it back together, this will be a working unit again. In my shed, in the past, talking oh, about shouldn't. <laughs> so we were talking about the different types of, of F1 fan, the ones who like the glamour, the ones who like the drama. You were briefly mm -hmm. asking me about Red Bull. Why a Red Bull in Formula One? It is interesting, but I guess a lot of teams come in as a marketing arm. So I think that's probably explanation. Yes, well, we can't ever answer for the content of Radio Cambridgeshire, but the sound seems to be OK. So, uh, yeah, let's put it all back together and see what happens. Yeah, well, as usual, my optimism was a little misplaced there. Um, before I put it back together, I thought I'd check that uh, this simple fix of repairing this volume control had properly made it work, because it seemed to. You know, we were getting some signal there from uh, Radio Cambridgeshire, and I thought I'd better check the AM bands as well, on which there was absolutely nothing. So <laughs> it's really annoying when you get something, because you think... I always think anyway that if something doesn't work at all that's easier to fix than something that works in pieces because when you fix that one thing it'll all spring back to life and that's what I thought I'd done but actually there are other pieces of it that don't work so now we have to dig into why the um, AM bit isn't working 
and uh, the first thing I normally do for this is basically just inject some um, intermediate frequency into it and see if that works. So if I take a loop aerial here and I tweak the generator to around the 470k mark which is where intermediate frequencies generally are, I think this is 475 but it nearly makes no difference, um, the loop should normally pick something up. You know if I do this with a working radio for example, let's try that just to prove that I'm not being a complete charlatan here. Um, so you can hear, here's a working radio, and you can hear that as I put the loop near it, it's basically going through the IF circuitry, not the tuner. Um, now, in the case of this set, I don't hear anything. So, looks like an IF frequency issue or maybe so it, yeah I mean it's, it's got to be that hasn't it <laughs> although I've said that a few times 